Let's return to the book of Hebrews chapter 11 this morning as we consider the fourth verse of Hebrews chapter 11. As we began last week studying, Hebrews chapter 11 is referred to as the honor roll of faith. And if you were not able to listen to that message, I'd be glad to make you a copy on compact disc or send you an MP3 of that message. But we began studying what faith is. Faith is not merely your cognitive effort in believing, but it is a spiritual attribute that is authored and finished by the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the evidence of God, as we noted in verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's the evidence of God in your heart because faith is a fruit of the Spirit, as we learned in Galatians 5.22. We also note that it's the intimate knowledge of God that begins at regeneration, the infinite, or intimate rather, knowledge of God which begins at the new birth. At the new birth, according to Hebrews 8, you and I know God, and it's the type of knowledge that we don't teach every man his brother and his neighbor saying, know the Lord. That is, it's not something that you and I can teach, but rather God himself will teach his children to know him from the least unto the greatest. And that language is found in the book of Hebrews chapter 8 as the Hebrew writer is describing this blessing that we have of the new covenant, the new worship covenant. We worship today by faith. And that was the entire message last week, the just shall live by faith. You know, saying that the least to the greatest shall know him. There's a great degree of peace that comes with that understanding. We often look at the greatest in the faith and we say, well, surely that's a man that knows God, but understand that God will teach the least of his elect family to know him. To little children that never make it into this life or mentally handicapped people that are God's children, he will call them by his grace and there is no temporal, earthly, or human factor that can get in the way of God in the reaching of his children with his grace. He will teach them all to know him from the least to the greatest. I'm thankful to know that the grace of God doesn't just apply to the greatest. Sometimes preachers in today's time speak in such a way that they make you think that only the greatest in the church are actually people who are saved by the grace of God. But I'm thankful to know that the grace of God doesn't just reach the greatest. Now, they're the greatest because they humble themselves to be the least. Understand. But I speak as a man. I'm thankful that the grace of God doesn't, doesn't just reach the greatest in the church, but it reaches the least in the church. It reaches the least in creation that are his children. To someone that sits and struggles with their sins, mourning and fearing through church service, to someone who is too ashamed to come to church, to children of God that lose their lives before they ever leave their mother's womb, understand the grace of God that brings salvation reaches the least of the brethren just as much as it reaches the greatest of the brethren. And this is the intimate knowledge of God that comes at the new birth. They will all know him from the least unto the greatest. We also describe faith as the Spirit of God, the Spirit of His Son, in our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. We read about that in Galatians 4, that when the, because we are sons, God sends the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. That heart cry, Abba, Father, you're crying out from the soul to God. And this is something that takes place on the heart, is from the very core of your being. This heart's cry is faith. And this is why Jesus authors and finishes it. It's not something that's the product of your intellect or your learning. And finally, we noted last week that faith is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What happens at the new birth? The spirit of his son is sent into your heart crying, Abba, Father. And that cry is faith. That cry of Abba, Father is faith. So then faith in you is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And as we will note, as we study through the lives of these men and women, men and women in Hebrews 11, everything they did was by faith, and so everything good that they did was by Christ in them. Anything that you can ever do that is pleasing to God Almighty will be done through Christ. 
What did Paul say in Philippians 4? I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. How is it that we do anything that is pleasing to God? Hebrews eleven six. Without faith it is impossible to please him. We do everything that we do that's pleasing to him by faith, by Christ in us. If there's one thing I want you to get out of this entire series, there are many practical lessons that we're going to learn. But if there's one doctrinal foundational truth that I want you to learn out of this is that faith is so much more than people today understand it to be. It is so much more. It is literally Christ in you crying unto his Father. The spirit of his Son enters your heart crying, Abba, Father. It is Christ seeking the Father within you from the very depths of your soul. And this is why an infant not yet even born can leap for joy in his mother's womb at the salutation of the mother of Christ. It's why even a baby can praise God because God puts faith within them. And it is not based upon their knowledge, their understanding. What understanding does a baby have? None at all. And yet babies are able to leap for joy at the salutation of Christ, of the mother of Christ. And so today we come to verse 4, and the first example that we consider in our study, and that is a man all the way back in Genesis chapter 4 named Abel, a man named Abel. Now, as far as why the writer is bringing all of this to our attention, understand as we consider the book of Hebrews in general that Hebrews is a book that's written to first century <clears throat> Jews who stood at risk of leaving New Testament Christianity and going back to Judaism. Now, these people were disciples of Christ. Paul is not writing to the Pharisees, or we believe it to be Paul. The writer is not writing to the Pharisees here. The writer is writing to first century Jewish believers. And if you want to go through and study this book in its entirety, you'll notice very specific language in chapter 3 and verse 1, for example, he writes to holy brethren, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And then he tells them to consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Is the writer writing to unregenerate Pharisees who hate Christ? No, he's not. He's writing to holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. But these holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling absolutely refused to let go of much of their Judaism and seek in the newness that is the new covenant. And that's what the entire book of Hebrews is about. Understand that there was coming a judgment on their nation that would happen in A.D. 70 in which their holy city, their temple, their priesthood, their records, everything would be destroyed. And this book of Hebrews is written to tell them, look, you have a very limited number of years... The time is at hand, and if you don't stand with Christ, you will be numbered with those who are transgressors, and you will face what they face as God judges them as a nation. There's a lesson in that as Americans for us as well, because every nation faces the judgment of God, and the time now is the time to stand for Christ, lest we face the judgment that our nation will eventually face. Paul begins all the way back with Abel. Abel is the first man in Scripture that does anything that we read that is acceptable and approved by God. Acceptable to and approved by God. Now, what is he doing in Hebrews? He's telling them that this new covenant is one in which we live by faith. And the principle of living by faith and pleasing God by faith predates the law that they could not turn loose of. The law that was given through Moses. It predates that by thousands of years. And living by faith is actually a principle that goes all the way back to the sons of Adam and Eve. And the point here is, listen, you are so infatuated with the law and the old covenant. And yet all of the patriarchs, the things that they did that were pleasing to God were not done through the law. The things that they did that was pleasing to God was done by faith. The just shall live by faith. So he's telling them that this faith principle 
is one that predates the Mosaic Law, predates the Old Covenant as a contract, it goes all the way back to the beginning of time. And so it is superior. Everything that we read about in Hebrews is superior. It's the superiority of Christ, the superiority of this worship, the superiority of the New Covenant, the superiority of the salvation that he has brought, the offering that he has brought. Everything about him is superior, including the lifestyle that we are to live as we live by faith, the faith that he has authored and finished within us. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 4, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead, yet speaketh. Now in one verse he sums up the account of Cain and Abel in the book of Genesis. And we will come back to this verse and draw out the observations that the writer makes. But I want to go back to Genesis chapter 4 and look at the actual experience that these two men had. Now we're in a chapter, Hebrews 11, about living by faith. And this first example that he gives us is Abel. Abel was the second son that we know of born to Adam and Eve. Now, Primitive Baptist, we believe literally what took place in Genesis. You say, I want to go to a church that believes the Bible. Congratulations, you have arrived. Because we believe this to be literally. It's not figurative language. It's not a metaphor. It's not an allegory. We, be we believe it to be very literal. Jesus taught that it was very literal. Every Bible writer spoke about Adam and Eve and the events that took place early in Genesis, the flood of Noah, as if they were literal events, so much so that much of Paul's theology was built upon the fact that Adam sinned and transgressed the law of God and death has passed upon all men for that, that one man had sinned. So Christ and Paul and any other New Testament reference looks back at this as literal, do you think that the writer of Hebrews believed that Abel, one of these sons of Adam and Eve, was merely a figurative individual? By faith, Abel offered. That's very literal, isn't it? So the New Testament, rather than assuming that the Old Testament was metaphorical, the New Testament assumes that it is all God-inspired history. It's fact, not to be up for discussion or debate. It is factual. Now we turn to Genesis 4 and we begin reading. This is directly after the fall of mankind. God created a man. He was upright. He was an upright, natural man. He was not a spiritual man. He, Adam in the garden was not born of the spirit. He was an upright, natural man. That's a theological point that needs to be clarified. And then when Adam sinned and violated the law of God, he became a corrupted, natural man. He became a sinner. He became a transgressor. He perverted and marred the image of God in which he was created. And as he began to have children, these children, as you read in Genesis 5, were born in the image of Adam. And that's why you and I are all sinners. It's also why the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, their foolishness unto him, 1 Corinthians 2.14. Because the natural man is conceived in a state of complete enmity against God. This is going to be very important as we consider the offerings of Cain and Abel because both of them present an offering to God. One of their offerings was received. Another one of their offerings was rejected. And the reason we'll see in just a moment, and it has everything to do with the fact that by nature men are at enmity with God. We are all from the moment of conception condemned criminals. And you say, well, what if they haven't done anything wrong? Our entire existence is such that that is literally an impossibility. We are that depraved that our actions will instantaneously condemn us. Our thoughts, the Bible says we come forth from the womb speaking lies. You think, what is that precious little baby crying about at three in the morning? He's lying. He's telling you, if you don't come in here right now, I am going to die. Please come get me. I'm dying. Not really. He would survive. But we come forth from the womb speaking <coughs> lies. If you wonder what that baby's crying, bless his or her little heart. We are just little 
bundles of Adam. Adam multiplied, we're made in the image of Adam. And so we condemn ourselves from the very moment that we are brought into this world by the things that we do. The statement needs to be made that we aren't sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. The reason we practice sin is because we are sinners. That's the nature that we have. We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others, Ephesians chapter 2. Adam knew Eve, his wife, verse 1 of Genesis 4, and she conceived and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord, And Abel, he also brought of the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Now there's theology involved in all of this that we'll look at later. But just notice the story. Read it. Put yourself there. These brothers offer to the Lord. God receives one offering. He doesn't receive the other offering. Cain was full of wrath. He was wroth, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now, God's words to Cain, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and unto thee shall be his desire, thou shalt rule over him. This is relative to who has the birthright in the family. Cain's not saying, if you, or God is not saying to Cain, rather, that if you live a sin-free life, then you get to rule over your brother and you'll be accepted with me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that You will be the head under Adam of all of these people that come from you. And you will be over him in authority. In other words, the fact that I don't receive your sacrifice and your offering doesn't mean that you will, as Esau did, serve. The elder shall serve the younger. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? Your father will keep you in the position that you are in. And unto thee shall be his desire. Thou shalt rule over your brother Abel. He tells Cain, look, just behave and and you'll have favor with your father. You will rule in your family. Cain was so angry and jealous. Remember that Song of Solomon says that jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Where do you think Solomon got that wisdom? Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Men have been known to kill through jealousy. Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. Cain murdered Abel. Now Cain, the name means to acquire, acquisition. And likely that name has reference to the fact that she had gotten a man from the Lord. Chapter 4 and verse 1, I have gotten a man from the Lord. The word Cain literally means acquired. And when he was born, they had acquired a man from the Lord. The word Abel, listen, this is very interesting, means either a meadow or a vapor. So the word Abel means vapor. Now, if you're a Bible reader, you know that the concept of smoke, steam, or vapor is often used, sometimes used, as a word picture for the brevity of life. Life is but a vapor. Abel's name literally means vapor, possibly alluding to the brevity of his life. Now, if he was named Abel, which means vapor, now, Perhaps it's, it's likely, or logical at least, that they began using the word Abel for vapor because his life was as a vapor. But if he was named vapor, named Abel, and Abel meant, Abel meant vapor to begin with, 
perhaps this is God's providence in the naming of a child. Now, we're not absolute predestinarians here in that we don't believe that everything that has ever happened is divinely scripted by God, but understand that God is a God of providence. And there have been many people in the history of the world who had been given by their parents names that God burdened them with when they named their children. Many people in the Bible are named appropriately to their situation later in life. Now, how do their parents know that? They didn't know that, but God burdened them perhaps even, you could say, by faith, by Christ in them, in his providence to give people names that were appropriate for their situation. And I believe this still happens today. Many of us remember Elder Obey, who obeyed God and left Tanzania, Africa, lived in Birmingham, went to Vestavia Primitive Baptist Church, heard the gospel, became liberated to preach, was ordained to the full work of the gospel ministry, moved back, to Tanzania, constituted a church there, and then oversaw the training of elders and the constitution of churches in Kenya, the country directly north of Tanzania. All of that happened because a man obeyed God, and yet his name from birth was what? Obey. Obey. I believe God is still, at times, in the business of providentially giving people names that are indicative of what they will be when they grow up, when they're men. Now, Cain was a farmer. As you see in the narrative, he presents an offering of the land, the ground. He raises crops. Abel, on the other hand, is a shepherd. Cain is a farmer. Abel is a shepherd. Both are noble, honorable traits. Perhaps as Adam and Eve had these children, Adam said, well, I've got a man from the Lord, I've got a helper, the thing that I dislike the most is farming, and so the first one's going to have to do that. Kind of like in the Winslet residence where Ethan turned about 12 and I didn't cut grass for four years because I don't like to cut grass and I had a man from the Lord and he was old enough to ride the mower so he had to cut the grass. Abel, as the next in line, was a shepherd. He took care of livestock. Now, at this point, these men are adults. I want you to understand that the concept, the, the way it's usually depicted in paintings and in literature and children's books is 15-year-old Cain gets angry with 13-year-old Abel, and the next thing you know, Cain murders Abel. But I want you to turn over to Genesis 5 and notice with me that shortly after the murder, directly after the murder of Abel, Cain murders him, Adam and Eve have another child, and they name this child Seth. But you'll notice that Adam was 130 years old when Seth was born. Now, if you're not familiar with this, before the flood, for whatever reason, I do not know, for whatever reason, men lived many times what men live today. It was not based on a lunar calendar because there were some people that didn't live 60 years. It was based on the same type of solar calendar that we have today, but men lived, literally, some of them, a thousand years. If you live a hundred years today, you are rare as an individual if you make it to a hundred. Adam, at this point, was 130 years. Just think about it. If you rewind history and if you take the biblical worldview... What do you have in the Garden of Eden? You have a perfect specimen of a man. Not yet genetically mutated, no cancers, no genetic deformities and diseases. Think about how genetically we understand that men are prone to cancer. Men are prone to certain diseases. We find that many of the diseases that men have that take their lives prematurely, based upon today's lifespan, are a result of genetics. Well, this man had a perfect genetic structure. And so outside of murder, men would live ten times the length that men live today. Now, after the flood, we see the lifespan take a, a hockey stick, if you were to chart it out on a graph, down to what it is today. Prior to the flood of Noah, lifespans were ten times what they are today. In the next paragraph, in Genesis 4, Cain... And his wife take off. And 
He's worried about other men in society killing him. Atheists often look at that and say, this is just a bunch of hogwash. There were three men on the planet and one woman. How could there be all these other people? Understand, it was 130 years. We read in Genesis 5 that Adam and Eve had many other sons and daughters. Just do some math with me. 130 years, perfect man, perfect woman. They don't have the internet, they don't have TV, they don't have Facebook, they don't have anything to distract them. 130 years, they could have had a child every 24 months. When those kids turned 16, you know what they did? They got married initially to siblings and then to nieces or aunts, uncles, eventually cousins. You say, that's gross. No, that was the only people on the planet. God made them and said, be fruitful and multiply. I was sharing this with a couple of preachers online, and one of them replied, you know, that sounds like Mississippi. <laughs> Think about that real hard. Anyway, 130 years, there were countless people on the planet. They had begun to colonize. They were fruitful. They multiplied. They scattered abroad in that region. Scattered abroad through that region. There were many people on the planet. This Cain is as old as 129 years old. 130 years old. And likewise Abel, a year younger, 18 months maybe, two years. I know people that have had children back to back to back year after year after year. So in a world without contraceptive, there could have been hundreds, thousands of people on the planet by then. Abel the shepherd is earth's first martyr. Cain is earth's first murderer. In Matthew 23, 35, Jesus is condemning the Pharisees and the religious elite of that day. And he tells the generation of Jews in their day that all of the righteous blood upon the earth shall be avenged on that generation of Jew beginning with Abel, righteous Abel, unto Zacharias, who was slain by them between the temple and the altar. Abel is the first martyr. Now, in the narrative, there's one thing that was interesting to me this week. How do these two men know which offering is accepted? It was obvious to both of them that one offering was accepted and one offering was rejected, and yet how do they know? It's a good question, isn't it? Now, we know that Abel received testimony that he was righteous when this happened, but how did God literally show this? There are several options. God could have spoken. But one of the ways that God has shown in Scripture and other locations what he accepts as far as offerings... Remember the story of Elijah the prophet as he stood there before the prophets of Baal and issued his challenge. Elijah says, put your offering upon the altar. If fire comes down and devours it, then your God is God, and I'm going to put my offering upon the altar. And if fire devours it, then my God is God. And they put the offering on the altar. The prophets of Baal call upon their gods. Elijah begins to mock them, saying, maybe he's taking a walk. Maybe your God is asleep. And they begin to cut themselves in their rage because God didn't show up because he doesn't exist. And as you know, Elijah the prophet pours water on his offering and calls unto God. And fire came down from heaven, devoured the offering, and even licked up the water that he had poured all over the offering. How did God show which offering had been accepted? He did so by devouring it by fire. I suspect that what took place is these men, not boys, but men, presented their offering unto God is that Abel's offering was devoured by fire. There's not Bible to prove that. And as I said, I suspect. That's my suspicion. It's conjecture. But it is good speculation. And it's also found in several commentaries that I looked up. He had to do it in a way that was obvious. He had to do it in a way that was obvious. 
Now, you'll notice that as God accepts this offering, listen very carefully to the language. The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Did God have respect unto Abel's offering first or unto Abel? The Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. And unto Cain and his offering, he had not respect. First, God had respect unto Abel, then to his offering. It wasn't that God did not like the vegetables that Cain brought. It wasn't that God liked the animal and the fat of the animal that Abel brought. It was that God had respect unto Abel, and God did not have respect unto Cain. Notice the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. There's this what comes first, the chicken or the egg thing that's at place here. Putting the cart before the horse, the respect was first to the man and secondly to the offering that that man had offered. Now following this, the Lord said unto Cain, where is Abel thy brother? He said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? I've seen ministries named my brother's keeper. Not the best idea. Sometimes we don't think things through. There was a church I know of that was on Broadway, and they named their church the Broadway Baptist Church. And I just thought, marketing committee didn't think that one through when they came up with the name of that organization. Maybe be really pithy and call it the straight and narrow Baptist church, but not the broad way. I don't think I would ever want to name a church Laodicea or Corinth either. And those are names of some of our churches. You're not setting the standard really high. Maybe that's why they would do that. We're just going to call ourselves one of the lazier rebuked churches in the Bible. And, you know, there's not a whole lot to shoot for there. <clears throat> Am I my brother's keeper? He said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Now you put that little statement in your mind because we're going to come back to it. The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. And now art thou cursed from the earth which hast opened her mouth to receive thy brother's blood from thy hand. When thou tillest the ground it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be. Cain said, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Thou hast driven me from the face of the earth. From, the faith, uh, from thy face shall I be hid, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. It shall come to pass that every one that findeth me shall slay me. The Lord said unto him, Whosoever slayeth Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. And he went out with his wife from the presence of the Lord. And that's the rest of the narrative. It's interesting that God says that no man is able to avenge himself. Vengeance belongs unto the Lord. And God would have his vengeance in his time upon Cain. One way or the other, either... And scripture doesn't indicate that Cain was a child of God, but if he were, then it would be... His vengeance would be carried out on the cross. The vengeance that you and I deserved, where was our vengeance carried out? Upon the cross. If not... It would befall him and will befall him at the end of time. There were also no governments in the world to which we are aware, of which we are aware in this day. Government is the only institution of men that has the authority to put someone to death. And Cain is worried that he's going to be executed. And God says, no one is going to execute you. I'll put a mark on you that no one will execute you. And anyone that executes you, he's going to be handled sevenfold more harshly than what I've done to you. Why? Because individuals don't have the right to take a life. Whether an unborn child or an aged person, we lack the right to take a life except in self-defense. Government is the institution in the world that has the right to take a life. Rulers, according to Romans 13, have the power of the sword. The sword is, an, is a tool for the taking of a life. Government has that authority. We do not. There were no governments yet. There were no governments yet. I would imagine that Adam was the government. It was a patriarchal society. And Adam is the top individual in the world. 
Now I want to look at the theology of Cain and Abel's experience because behind every action there is theology that explains what has taken place. In fact, biblical theology provides us for the framework for understanding and interpreting events. Biblical theology provides us with the framework for understanding and interpreting life events. There are reasons why things take place. Theology is the study of God and the study of his doctrine, the study of his word. We learn through theology why the world is the way that it is. Now, as we've noted that God had not respect unto Cain nor to his offering, the first thing I want to notice is that without faith it is impossible to please God. Hebrews 11.6, without faith it is impossible to please him. Now, with that thought in mind concerning God not accepting Cain and not accepting his offering, notice 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12. In verse 11, John exhorts us to love one another. And that's what we are to do in the New Covenant Church. We are to love one another in Christ's church, not as Cain who was of that wicked one. Let's look at theology to explain reality. God didn't have respect first unto Cain, and because he did not have respect unto Cain, he did not have respect unto Cain's offering. According to 1 John chapter 3 and verse 12, under divine inspiration, John writes that Cain was of that wicked one. What does that mean? It means that Cain was not born of the Spirit of God. Cain was not born of God. Now, whatever happened to him after that time, I have absolutely no idea. It's not for me to say. It's not my business. Most suspect that Cain was not ever a child of God, but we have no information about him one way or the other. But we do know at this time that he was not of God. Jesus used this terminology in John chapter 8 as there were Jews there who did not believe Christ, they did not believe in Christ, they did not receive the words of Christ, they mocked Christ with backhanded comments, which is why we're supposed to let our yeas be yea and our nay be nay. They spoke with backhanded comments. For example, they said, oh, we're Abraham's seed. We not be born of fornication. We're not born of fornication. We're Abraham's seed. What are they doing? They're accusing Jesus' mother of sin. They're accusing Jesus' mother of sin. That's a backhanded comment to him saying that they had never been in bondage to any man. And Jesus just plainly tells them, You are of your father, the devil. The lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. He is the father of lies. And you are his children. Now, were they literally children of Satan? No, Satan doesn't have children. But he was the chief influence in their life. And their wicked depravity was because of the temptation of Satan in the beginning of time. One who is not born of the Spirit of God is of that wicked one in that that wicked one is the chief influence in their life. Cain was of that wicked one and slew his brother. Wherefore slew he him, John asks, because his own works were evil and his brother's righteous. Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hate you. Cain was of that wicked one, and so his works were evil. Now you say, but he presented an offering unto God. Well, remember, without faith it is impossible to please him. The sacrifices of the wicked are an abomination unto God. So says the Old Testament. Cain was wicked, and so his offerings were abomination to God. They were not offered by faith. They were not offered by God in him. Now, this is a very pointed lesson. Listen here. Sometimes people look like they are just like you. They may go to worship in a church. They may say, I believe in God. They may give money to causes that look to be benevolent organizations. Some of them are like Cain. And on the inside, they're full of hate. Depravity. And if they offer to God, it's for a selfish reason. And nothing that they do is by faith because they are of that wicked one. 
We only see the outside. Would you agree with the statement that there's way more to you on the inside than the outside? Could we take what's on the inside and place it on a big screen behind me and contrast it to what everyone else sees about us? Would there be more on the big screen? I think there would be with every one of us. Now, take someone void of the Spirit of God. What's on the inside is extortion and excess. The religious Pharisees, Jesus said of them in Matthew 23, that they are whited sepulchers full of dead men's bones. They're like someone who got a cup or a plate and cleaned the outside, but the inside is full of rot. They're like tombs that men have adorned with jewels. And yet on the inside, it's bones and death and stench and disgusting death. It's just terrible. That's Cain. That's Cain. He is of that wicked one. His sacrifice was an abomination because, listen, the only way to please God is by faith. And what is faith again? Who in you the hope of glory? Christ. Faith is Christ in you. Without Christ in you, you can do nothing pleasing to God. Why? Because you are totally depraved. How's that for an uplifting message? Without Christ, we are totally depraved. But that's the truth of the matter. That's biblical theology. That's why this world is such a terrible place. Now, that's awful, isn't it? But there's a flip side to that coin. Everyone who is truly good, you know why they're good? Because Christ is within them. Christ saw fit not to just wipe us off the face of the earth, not to just leave us in our sinful condition. He saw fit to send his spirit into our hearts, putting goodness in us and thereby goodness in this world. He chose to come to this world and bleed and die and offer himself to God for us so that we would be rescued finally in the resurrection from this terrible contradiction of natures that we have between the flesh and the spirit. And we will be delivered from that, conformed to his image for all of eternity. That will not be a problem in heaven. When we inhabit the new heavens and the new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness, there will be no more struggles with the flesh. We'll be exactly as Christ. That substance of things hoped for, it's going to make up our entire person. God had not respect unto Cain because Cain was of that wicked one. And because Cain was of that wicked one and God had not respect unto Cain, God had not respect to Cain's offering. God had respect unto Abel and unto Abel's offering. Why did God have respect unto Abel and unto Abel's offering? Because Abel was born of the Spirit of God. Understand that Paul is giving us a lesson to New Testament believers that Christ is the author and the finisher of their faith and for an example of that, he goes all the way back to Abel. Never for a moment believe that there is a different way of saving sinners today than there was from the beginning of time. Abel was saved the same way you're saved. God the Father chose him before the foundation of the world. Christ died for him upon the cross of Calvary. And the Spirit of God regenerated him, quickened him when he was dead in trespasses and in sins. Abel's experience is your experience. But you know what? You've got something more blessed than Abel. You have the fullness of the story of redemption. Whereas Abel is living on the heels of the fall. You are, in a sense, more blessed than Abel. Abel's offering was received... Because Abel offered it by faith. And Abel offered it by faith because Christ dwelled in Abel. Now I want to transition into the gospel in Abel's experience. Number one, when Abel was murdered, notice what takes place back in Genesis 4. When Abel was murdered, 
verse 10, God says to Cain, what, what hast thou done? Listen, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. As one commentator said, this makes Abel prototypical of Christ. But that's not merely the words of commentary. Notice the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 24. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinklings, or sprinkling, that speaketh better things than that of Abel. What did Abel's blood do? <clears throat> Abel's blood cried out to God... For vengeance. But Abel's blood cried out to God. Abel's blood cried from the earth to God. And his blood cried for vengeance. What did Cain receive? Vengeance. Now, Christ's blood speaks better things than that of Abel. There's a gospel lesson in this. So says Hebrews 12, 24. Abel's blood cried for vengeance. Christ's blood cries for satisfaction of God's wrath. Abel's blood screamed for vengeance. Christ's blood satisfied the vengeance that Abel's blood and every other martyr's blood screams for. As we are guilty sinners... Christ's blood is applied to us, and rather than vengeance, we receive salvation from sins. Abel was prototypical of Christ. Abel's blood cried. Christ's blood cried. But also, and this was a point that I enjoyed thinking about this week. Listen. When Abel made his offering to God, he made it how? By, say it, by faith. Something like faith. Is that right? Faith. Made his offering by faith. And that's why it was received. Faith is Christ in you. Makes his offering by faith. What did Abel offer unto God? Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. This was offered by faith. Faith is Christ in you. That means that Christ in Abel burdened Abel to make an offering foreshadowing the offering that Christ would make 4,000 years later upon the cross. So, say that again. By faith, Abel foreshadowed the death of Christ when Abel offered the firstling of his flock. What was Christ? The first fruits from the dead. Christ is the firstling of our flock. He's the firstling. And what did he do? He died. There was death. What happened to the animal that Abel offered? It died. There was death. And that offering was accepted by God. Accepted by God. The gospel was preached by God through burdening Abel to offer a sacrifice that foreshadowed the death of Christ. Because he did it by faith, and faith is Christ in Abel. Abel is blessed to preach, or rather, God preached his own gospel 4,000 years before Christ through burdening Abel to do this and enabling him to do this by faith. Cain's offering was of the earth, earthy, if you want to look at it that way. It was the product of the ground. God will not receive the product of men's hands and the work of men in redemption. The offerings that he prescribed in his word when Moses would come along was the death of an animal, a bull, a lamb without spot or blemish, or a bird. Death. It points to death. Pointing to the death of Christ that we all may live. God preached his own gospel by burdening Abel to make a sacrifice of the firstling of his flock. 
Now, there are two practical applications that we want to give you and close the message for today. First of all, let's go back to Hebrews chapter 4. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. What was Abel doing? He was worshiping. By faith, we are able to worship God acceptably. There is an acceptable and an unacceptable way to worship God. John 4 says that the hour is coming when true worshipers shall worship him in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. One of the greatest errors in Christendom that has ever arisen is that it doesn't matter how we choose to worship God as long as we do worship God. Well, God says that we need to worship him in spirit from the inside by faith and in truth according to what is true and factual and right. Blind zeal and ignorant worship is not approved by Scripture. This has an effect on the way that we worship, on what we sing when we worship, on what we say when we pray, on the reverential way that we describe God. The irreverence in modern Christendom is one of my biggest pet peeves. People talk about God in such a trendy and catchy way that it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. Understand that he is the king of creation. If you stood before the president of the United States, you would probably be respectful. This is the king and creator and judge of all the universe. Spirit and truth. Faith enables you and me to worship God acceptably. God-pleasing worship is enabled by faith. The just shall live by faith. But also notice the next phrase. By which he obtained witness. By faith, Abel obtained witness that he was righteous. What made Abel righteous? The blood of Christ. What witnessed to the fact that Abel was righteous? the faith that Christ had authored within him, specifically when he walked by faith. The final application of this today is that when we walk by faith, here in our lives, we receive witness that we are righteous. This is the entire concept of justification by faith. We are declared to be just in our consciences, in our minds, in our experience, When we walk by faith, God does give us assurance of our salvation. He testifies. He gives witness that we are indeed righteous in the sight of God. If you say, Pastor, I want to feel as if I am righteous. I I love to feel that everything is okay between me and my heavenly Father. You'll never receive that by the works of the law. The letter killeth. It's a spirit that gives life. But when you walk by faith, you will experience the firsthand blessing of God and his felt presence in your life, and you will obtain witness, just like Abel, that you are righteous. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this lesson that we've read today. We pray, Father, that we would be like Abel, who worshiped by faith, showing the work of Christ in the way that he worshiped. He displayed the offering of Christ. We pray, Father, that you would deliver us from such as like Cain, who would hate us, but we know, Father, that the world will hate us, and we should not marvel, because as Cain slew Abel, this world will despise us because we seek you and because your favor rests upon us. Thank you, dear Lord, for your grace, the unmerited favor that changes us from being like Cain into being like Abel. And we thank you, Father, that you've sent the spirit of your son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, enabling us to live by faith. We pray, Father, that you forgive us of our many sins. We pray that you would help us to forgive those that have sinned against us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name.